here is a Terp Talk special. This is Bruce Posner and Carl Science talking about Brooks Robinson and the season that the Baltimore Orioles have had. Bruce has been one of the biggest Oriole fans I've ever met. Of course, Carl and the Science and Kirk team, uh, they're just embedded in the history of Baltimore. So take a listen and let's celebrate that Oriole victory as they win the American League East and look forward to the playoffs this week. All right, welcome in everybody to Science and Kirk Turp Talk this Wednesday night. And before we get into the show, uh, Carl, Carl Science in with me tonight. We have to take a moment and just marvel and and really mourn at the life of Brooks Robinson. Uh, He is, Carl, I don't know if you, you know, what year were you born? 1967. So you you missed a lot of it, but you know the story. And you also, I'll bet you've met Brooks because everybody has met Brooks. What were your, uh, let me say this to you. The greatest third baseman ever. All right, without question, defensively, uh, not batting wise, but a tremendous clutch hitter, the heart of the team, and uh, kind of reminds you of Adley Rushman a little bit. He was the guy that everybody loved, and you just could see it throughout the baseball world yesterday as they mourned the loss of this icon. What, what were your impressions of him? So, I mean, my first memory regarding. Brooks Robinson would definitely be, I think it must have been 1977. I think that's the year he retired. And there was a Brooks Robinson day or night at Memorial Stadium in September. I remember being there for that. And, but I also remember that realizing, recognizing that this guy was like the local sports hero. I mean, I rec- you know, recognized that early on, you know, definitely was aware of his um, stature in the game of his main career highlights, you know, as a young kid, I mean, the, the, come a couple of the bigger mental images I have as a young Orioles fan is that image of him jumping in the air in 1966 after the Orioles won the World Series against the Dodgers. It was like a famous iconic image of him, you know, skipping towards the mound. I guess I don't I don't remember who was on the mound, but um, I and you remember those plays he made in the 1970 World Series. And, and hearing about Lee May and Johnny Bench and Pete Rose pulling their hair out, you know, uh, about this guy stealing all these hits. Um, but mostly you learned about him, from my perspective, as a local hero, as a guy that that it was more than just the sport on the field, about how he impacted the city and the community. It, he was definitely my first understanding of what a sports hero looked like. It was almost sort of like a Baltimore version of Joe DiMaggio, you know, where Very well put. Generations, generations beloved him. Not everybody saw him play, but everybody heard about his play, but also more importantly, his demeanor off the field. He was one of those handful of guys. You can't name many, I don't think, around the country that really Baltimore has been lucky. We've John Unitas, Brooks Robinson, Cal Ripken. I mean, to have three guys like that be sort of the Mount Rushmore of your city's sports heroes is pretty amazing. Yeah, and you named the three for sure. Um, You know, Frank Robinson came to the Orioles in 66, and Orioles had a great year, won the pennant, go to the World Series. I'll never forget the first inning when we're up against, uh, you know, we got to face the staff at Drysdale and Koufax. Now you're talking about two of the, you know, greatest pitchers ever, all right? And to sweep that team and in the first inning get two home runs from Brooksy and Frank, it, it, it sticks in my mind. And, you know, then you go to, like you said, 1970. If you ever had, like, 12 hours to watch, you know, highlights, it was play after play after play. He had to have made 10 impossible plays. Kind of like you if, uh, put a comparison to it. 
You remember when Manny came up and he had that hot defensive streak where yeah. a third base and why they ever moved him to short, I'll never know. But he had that hot streak at third base. He was incredible. Brooks did this year after year, day after day. He was just, uh, you know, you can remember the errors because there were so few, you know. But, you know, and then I think his final his final toll was a three-run pinch at home run to win a game midseason, and, it, and that was about – that was about it for him. Yeah, you're right. He you know, was they- unbelievable. But, uh, you know, it's so, it's sad that he didn't get a chance to watch this team because, you know, a lot of my friends know him because they live in caves, at Caves Valley, and that's where he lives. And all they did was just rave about him. What a great guy. And he his health hasn't been great over the past years, but he's 86. Right. But – he didn't get a chance to see this team and maybe make a move. But it's so funny. Uh, last night you texted me with the one nothing win. Tell everybody the stat that just so blows amazing. you away. I mean, sometimes sometimes numbers are just numbers, right, Bruce? Right. But but sometimes there's something mythical and mystical about numbers. And and last night was one of those times. So the Orioles, of course, won against the Nationals last night, one to nothing, you know, a leadoff home run by our new young third baseman, you know, of the future. I think he's a third baseman in the future. I assume that he'll be moving to third base. He can be wherever he wants. That's true. (laughs) But we'll cross that bridge. But certainly the new star of the team, Gunnar Henderson, um, we win one nothing. And it turns out in Major League history, the player with the most RBIs and a one nothing win is Brooks Robinson with 10 of them during his career, which is, A, it's a really cool number to, you know, to, to well, know. It shows you how great the pitching staff was. All it, right. does, it does that. It also shows you what they – that there's a lot of, you know, you look at Brooks Robinson's numbers, especially, you know, in today's world and the way that we look at numbers for baseball now, um, you know, obviously they're much, they're much bigger now. There's a lot more guys hitting 40, 30, 40, 50 home runs. But back in his day, he really was known as a clutch hitter. And this is one stat that really does bear that out. For sure. All right, let's move on. And we'll be talking about Brooks forever. We'll have Brooks Robinson stories. And though I'm sure it'll be a great day honoring him. But uh, I, hope, I hope they put the number five patch on for the playoffs, which I presume that they will. But I think that'd be a nice. It would, make, it would make sense. Yes. So here we are, Carl. Uh, two games. Well, a magic number of two. The game, yeah. it could be clinched. The game starts in about 20 minutes, and it could be clinched tonight. Uh, it it will be clinched. I don't even want to think about the opposite. All right. It will it has be clinched. To. has to but, happen. Of course it's going to happen. Yeah, it, 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 it's like inevitable. And uh, 98 wins, 59 losses right now with five games to go. And – it's just, it's it's uh, it's mind blowing, you know. And it, it's one of those situations you remember with great teams, and every year there's teams that win a hundred games. So usually yep. there is, but you every time a team like this loses, you say what? You know, you feel like is something wrong? No, it's just normal to lose. You know, to yep. win a hundred, it just happens. And like, uh what I've loved is the way the pitching staff has developed. All right. And more so, I love what Kano did last night, striking out the side at the bottom of the ninth. And looking but, and looking like his confident self again, which was nice to see. Well, look, you have right now, let's look at the starting staff uh, for the, for the uh, playoffs. And it's so easy. Your question is, do you start Bradish or do you start a uh, Grayson? I don't know. Oh, I if, right. if if you have that week off, <clears throat> I think it's probably Bradish, and then yeah. Grayson, and then probably Gibson, and maybe Kramer is your fourth starter, or Means. I'm going. I'm going with. I'm going Bradish, G Rod, and Means, and Bruce. I'm not looking back. Not even thinking about it. Those are my first three guys every series, in my opinion. It, 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 depending upon the matchups and what high, you know, but. 
But to me, those those three guys are your guys going forward. Um, and I, I think, you know, one of the other three, meaning Gibson, Kramer, or Flaherty, will be the swing fourth, right? And the, the other guys are in the bullpen. Yeah, I think Flaherty's in the bullpen for sure. Me too. And, uh, you know, I don't know what's going to happen with, in that fourth spot. If it is, I think it might be Gibson. Uh, you know. I think it's Gibson with a short hook. Right. It could be, listen, it could be Gibson without a short hook because he's you know, these guys, I'm telling you that he's he's been there and he's better than we think. We're just judging. We're judging this is what we're doing now is we're judging too hard. If a guy gives up three or four runs, we're looking at it like a bad performance. And if you go five innings and give up three runs, that's a good performance today. Yeah. The, the key is to can the bat stay alive because we know the pitching is going to be somewhat uh, strong, and then you have the bullpen. And when you put these starters in the bullpen, you have the look. Every game that we play in the playoffs, we're not going to get an eight inning shutout performance. So somewhere along the line, somebody's going to get hit. It could be any of these guys, and then you could come in with another starter. Correct. All right, that's what happens. You know, in the in the playoffs and everything else you don't usually face a team for the third time when that third time comes around you're starting with the bullpen because that's if when a guy's in trouble that's when it normally is so you got to watch that closely but i don't know who it's going to be but i'm not worried about it uh i agree the, the only thing and you know i think that uh brandon hyde and Let's give him props. He's been unbelievable. And we're in this position now because starting about 40, 50 games ago, in my opinion, he has played every game like it's a World Series game. He has, you know, a couple times he had to stay with the starter longer than he wanted to because of the bullpen needed rest. And the bullpen's been really, really burned out. But you saw what happened last night when the guys got rest. Okay when Kano had some days to pitch and, uh, and Cino Perez has kind of developed and Cologne needs a little bit of rest between uh, efforts, but it's just been an overall team effort. Uh, uh, and what a fight of come behind uh, victories. And uh, to me, if we win the division and host that division series starting probably next Saturday, or two Saturdays is season's a success no matter what happens. Now, but however, it's time to get greedy because it's hard to get to that position. That's all right. right? You got to take advantage of it. In your mind, does this team have the the verve, the the fight, the strength to make that move to go all the way? Okay. From a Emotional and heart and fan standpoint, one hundred percent. I think they have the they have the, the right mix of youthful exuberance and naivete. Right? I mean, I think they're going to love being on that stage. I don't think they're going to shrink from it at all. That they're going to really um, feed off of it. I think they have some veterans, um, Gibson in particular. You know, um, Frazier, I think, that, you know, have been around long enough to know you don't take this for granted. And I'm sure that lesson will be will be imparted. But, you know, but do they have the gumption? I mean, here's one thing to consider. The Orioles have had a long and great history, and they've had some amazing teams. But this team is only the third to win 50 games on the road, 1980 and 1997. This may, I mean, they've won more road games than the 66 Orioles, the 69 Orioles, the 70 Orioles, the 71 Orioles, the 79 Orioles, the 83 Orioles. They've won more road games than those teams. So that says something about their fortitude. That says something about their toughness. That says something about their competitiveness. Um, you know, I, I think being able to win on the road as a young baseball team and do it the way they did it this year, pretty amazing. So, yeah, I think they've got what they what it takes. Uh, Carl, I only fear is that stage, does the stage get too big? And I look at two guys, to me, that are going to be crucial in this series. Uh, 
We know with Adley, we know with Gunner, they're pretty consistent of what they do. They draw walks, they get hits, you know, and you go through the lineup. But to me, the the strength of this team throughout the year have been the three, four batting positions. And that's Santander and uh, Ryan O'Hearn. And, and Mountcastle. And Mountcastle. I hope he's back. Okay. Uh, and Austin Hayes. Yeah. And, it, you know, it doesn't stop. But I think those positions are where the RBIs come in. And those positions are where the big hits are needed when the two guys are on base. I've seen in the past three, four games that – the clutch hitting, the timely hitting has not been there. All right. Last night and the game before, we could have had a lot more than one run. We're leaving, we're not getting that hit right this minute. And again, we're micro analyzing where we are right, right now. That's my fear. All right. This team is going to get on base. You know it. I don't care who we face. And when we, the better the pitcher, the better we do. All right. In my opinion, I mean, yeah. We got a, a the guy Gray was okay yesterday. He pitched well, but anybody we face, look, we got to Verlander. We got to every ace there is. All right, and I got to tell you something. Right now, we got a couple aces ourselves, and yeah, that's the key. All right, Grayson and uh, Bradish, I you fear no one. All right, your final thoughts before we go, Carl. I mean, based on what, just thinking about what you just said, I mean, look, the great teams in baseball, you, you lose 62 times a year. Even if you're a great team, you right. want to lose 62. So, you know, part of that is ebb and flow, right? Because there's because then there's three or four games in a row where they just, every time there's somebody on base, they're getting a hit, you know? So, you know, that's it's that's part of the spectacle of October, you know? It, it's who gets hot, who gets on a roll, who has that momentum going, and, but I, I think a young team like this, man, if they can get on that roll, boy, can they go. Boy, can they go far. They can go far for sure. Carl, that's going to do it for this segment. Thanks so much for coming on. And obviously, thanks for all your support here on Science of Kirk Turk Talk. And Science of Kirk presents uh, the Sports Maven on Saturday. And uh, we're off to rock and roll and start talking about clinch and pennant. So I take care of business first. Fun time, to be a, fun time to be a sports fan of Baltimore. It Did sure is. All right, this is Bruce Poster. We'll be back in a few minutes here on 1300 AM, the bet with segment two. And Bruce Laird would take a look at the Ravens, which this week is another story. Uh, <laughs> and then we'll talk about, certainly talk about Maryland football in the final segment. Back in a few here on Science and Kirk, Turp Talk.